This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. The final chapter deals with ratio analysis, something which you should have done many, many times. It would have come into F3, it would have come into F8 and auditing in terms of your analytical procedures. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it, it's, it's important in planning. It al- allows you to uh, d- decide how either your company or perhaps a target company is doing and uh, so on. So if we'll go through it really quite, quite quickly. Uh, the normal ratios divide into these categories, profitability, efficiency, liquidity, gearing and investment ratios. Uh, you have to try to be able to, to say something about these, something sensible uh, about them. There is no point, in, particularly in saying that if the, uh, you know, the receivables collection period has gone up, this is because your customers are paying more slowly. You know, that's what it means. Uh, we, we should be scratching away and thinking, well, maybe why are customers paying more slowly? Is it that we have uh, extended our markets into a foreign country, uh, and it takes longer for the goods to get there, and therefore longer between before people pay, and so on. So, looking at uh, profitability uh, ratios uh, here, very important one is the gross profit margin or the gross margin. That's your gross profit over uh, uh, the revenue. I always think of this as the mainspring of a company. If you don't have a decent gross profit, it's very hard to end up with a decent net profit. The net profit margin or the operating profit margin, as it might be called, is in the profit or operating profit before interest and tax. Uh, divided by the revenue again. And it's sometimes worth, uh, you know, to to see why maybe the gross profit margin is is staying quite healthy, but the net profit margin has fallen. It's sometimes worth uh, uh, doing another little investigation in here, which is basically your expenses over the revenue. Uh, 100 times all of that. So as you increase your turnover, you would would hope if they had a a decent management structure that the expenses wouldn't increase much more rapidly than the turnover. Unfortunately, in many situations, as a business expands, uh, the expenses kind of get a bit out of control and uh, begin eating into the net profit. Return on capital employed, uh, like putting money in the bank, so to speak, and what do you earn on that? It's a profit, again, before interest and tax over the capital employed. Uh, the, the only thing people normally get wrong in this here is what is capital employed. It is the share capital, it is the equity uh, or the reserves, and it is the long-term liabilities. So it's all sources of capital on the bottom line. Some people do asset turnover. Myself, I never get too excited uh, about it. It's really saying how many dollars worth of revenue do you generate per dollar worth of of asset? How hard are you working the assets? Efficiency ratios, uh, really dealing with uh, payables, receivables, inventory. Uh, I think of this as receivables, uh, say for the receivables collection period, as receivables over revenue per day. So so sometimes you'll get a little bit mysterious. Why is it multiplied by uh, kind of 365 and so on? Uh, there, this should be times 365 actually. But if you think it's receivables over uh, uh, receivables over revenue per day, how many days worth of revenue are in receivables? It comes back to exactly that. So, receivables collection period, you tend to get a little bit worried if it increases substantially. Payables days, again, if it increases substantially, you, you wonder. Perhaps people can't pay. Uh, and the days of inventory, inventory uh, divided by cost of sales times 3.6. Either this increases a lot, then again you get worried maybe they can't sell it. Maybe there's a lot of old stock in there which is simply not shifting. Of course, all of these might be deliberate. Maybe inventory's increased a lot because they're planning a big marketing campaign. Uh, we, we don't know really what, what causes it, but we can raise maybe questions, worries. Liquidity ratios. Uh, this is uh, one where you know if the the current ratio you'd like to see it at probably you know, at least one 
uh, here. Uh, similarly, the, the quick ratio, uh, they take out of that the inventory uh, in, in here. This is how easy it is to be able to pay uh, your liabilities, your wages and so on, your current liabilities uh, out of your current assets, the cash, the receivables and the inventory. Because the inventory uh, may take a long time to convert into cash, that's why this quicker asset test ratio is sometimes used instead. Uh, these uh, ratios here, it's difficult to say very much about them absolutely. You can't say really whether a gross profit percentage is good or bad. Uh, one of the secrets of all sorts of ratio analysis is really comparatives. Have things got better or worse than last year? Have the receivables collection periods got longer or shorter than last year? The inventory days got longer or shorter than last year? Then you can begin to say something more sensible about it. Gearing or kind of risk ratios uh, here. How much of the capital comes from long-term liabilities? Uh, and uh, if it's a very high gearing ratio, it means there's an awful lot of borrowing in the company. And although we want to see some borrowing, very high borrowing, can mean they may find it very difficult to pay the interest. Uh, this here is quite, I like this one actually, I always like it more than the gearing ratio here. How many times could they pay their interest burden out of the profit before it is in tax? So if you come out with an answer there like six, you could pay your interest six times uh, out of your profits, then you're probably going to be pretty relaxed. If you come out with interest cover like 1.5, the interest is taking nearly all of your profit Profit only needs to fall a little bit and you will not have profits available to pay the interest, then you're going to get more worried. And finally, uh, two investor ratios here, the PE ratio and the earnings per share. Uh, the PE ratio, you have to compare this to similar quoted companies. So compare to so let's say our company had a PE ratio of 12 uh, and uh, of our quoted companies, similar companies had a PE ratio of only 9. Okay, So an average of other companies uh, was going to be uh, 9. Uh, we have a PE ratio of 12. This means that for some reason people are willing to pay for 12 times our earnings in the share price but only 9 times other people's earnings. Uh, they, for some reason, are, seem to be thinking our, our company is particularly attractive. Uh, but it, yet it's in a similar business. It's, they're all supermarkets or they're all house builders, something of that sort. And what a high PE ratio compared to similar company means, it must mean that they expect growth. Because the earnings per share here, these are historical. Those were last year's earnings per share but price per share is current. So the current price per share, you should be paying for future earnings, not past earnings. And that's maybe what you have your eye on. And this in a way almost, almost distorts what the PE ratio seems to be saying. And then as the earnings per share, people like to see that going up. This is more fundamental than dividends per share. The directors can increase and decrease dividends per share with a great deal of latitude. But the earnings per share is not something which the directors have really particular control over. People like to see earnings per share increase each year. It effectively means that a company is, is really doing pretty well.